Good morning and welcome to Rose Red Homestead, where today we're going to um, talk a little bit about something very closely related to food security. And that is, we're gonna talk about the 10 most common mistakes people make when they do pressure canning. As all of you know, we focus on the right safe way to do things, but sometimes it is important to have a contrast we can know the right way, but we also need to know the wrong way how to do things or what we should not do. So it's easier to keep us on the path to good canning if we head toward the good and safety, but we know what lurks on the side in terms of things that we should not do. So we're going to go through 10 things and they are not in any particular order. One is not more important than the other. They all have very much to do with uh, with safety in pressure canning and what you should not do, otherwise it will jeopardize the safety of the food that you produce. We're not doing anything about foods today. This is not about canning um, anything in particular. This is about just the canning process relative to the canner itself. So we're going to get started right now. And um, first on the list is to, the one mistake that people make is that they do not check their equipment often. The equipment in pressure canning varies from canner to canner, but your setup, if you are doing stovetop cooking and, and stovetop canning, and this relates to stovetop canning, although you can transfer it to those of you that have um, electric canners like the Nesco or the Presto Electric, you can make some transfers here. But I'm going to be using my um, 23 quart Presto stovetop canner. And number one is, uh, is not checking your equipment. So let's give just a quick rundown. The pot is usually just fine all by itself. Now the other pieces of equipment are the racks. This is the rack that came with my canner, but I often do double deckers of pints and so I bought a second one. It doesn't match the first one, but ask me if I care. And so um, making sure that we've got the right equipment for the right batch and then to be sure that we check our equipment. This is where most of the action takes place is with the lid. Now on the inside of the lid, we need to check to be sure <clears throat> the gasket is in good order. I just, and this is also called the ceiling ring. There should be no debris under here, so just give it a quick look and, um, and then make sure that there are no nicks or scratches and that it is still very pliable. Uh, mine is new because I just recently replaced it. So right here is an air vent. It has a cover. So this is the air vent cover. It also, when... Um, if it, the steam is coming at it this way, it's going to push against this little piece and push that air vent lock cover up. And then when it's in the up position, it does not allow any air to escape. So we need to be sure that this is in good order. Uh, sometimes what happens is this comes loose and this just screws on. So you can screw it on and unscrew it. You can just double check to be sure that it's very tight. This little button right here is a hard rubber button and it is called the overpressure plug. And what happens with this is if there's too much pressure in the canner and it reaches the danger zone, then this is gonna blow and it just pops right out and then it releases the pressure so there will not be any kind of an explosion. You'll have a lot of steam coming from this, which can be startling. And actually we have done a video on um, what to do if your pressure canner blows. And it rare, I've never had it happen. It's rare to happen, but some people on that video reported that it had happened. And had they been able to um, go through it in their heads by looking at that video that we produced, it, they would not have been so frightened when it happened. So that may be a good video for you to check out. And then the other thing is we need to be sure that the vent is clear. This is, of course, the um, air vent here. So just check your equipment every single time. And we'll get to this in just a minute. Second on the list is putting the right amount of water in the bottom of the canner. 
I get asked all the time, how much water should I put in the bottom of my canner? How much water did you put in your canner? Well, it is important that you read your instruction booklet. Your instruction booklet will tell you the right amount of water for your canner because it has been calibrated to last long enough for even the longest processing times as specified by the USDA. Now for us, it's about two inches of water, between two and three inches of water. There needs to be enough water in there to produce the steam for the entire processing time. And so it is very important that you put the right amount of water in. If you run out of water, you're gonna run out of steam. There's no steam being produced and it's gonna mess up the processing time and the safety of your food. The other um, thing not to do relative to water in the canner is to fill it too full. For any size canning jar, the water should come up to somewhere in this area right here. Never, ever, ever put water up over the top of jars. That's something not to do relative to the water in the canner because that will not allow the steam, the heated steam, to get to the jars. And the heat transfer depends on steam surrounding those jars. So make sure that you have the right amount of water. Um, the next thing that is on my list, number three, is once the canner is locked and is heating, then pretty soon steam is going to start escaping from this vent. A big mistake is not allowing a full 10 minutes of venting where steam comes up out of this vent. What happens there is there's air you enclosed when you put this lid on, you enclosed the air that was already in the bottom of the canner. All of that air has to get out of there because we need that to be replaced with steam in order to bring the canner up to the proper pressure and temperature. So we, we've got to have all of that air um, uh, replaced. By venting for 10 minutes, the steam is pushing all around on the inside of the canner and escaping and bringing the air with it so that at the end of 10 minutes, when we then put our weight on, and this is a pressure regulator right here, um, then it will hold the steam on the inside. The air is all gone and we are set to go. So it is very, very important. Now, the next thing is um, a big mistake is not using the correct pressure for your elevation. Now, most of the canning recipes in the USDA guidelines book specify that a thousand, sometimes 2,000 feet and below are to be processed at 10 PSI, pounds per square inch of pressure. 10 pounds of pressure, we often say, well, I'm processing mine at 10 pounds. Well, that means 10 pounds per square inch. So just imagine every little square inch has 10 pounds of pressure pushing on every surface of it. So that's a good deal of pressure, but the higher the elevation, the lower the boiling point. For instance, at sea level, boiling point, we all learned in our high school physics classes that uh, the boiling point of water is 212. A lot of times they neglect to say 212 at sea level. And some of us grow up thinking that boiling point is um, constant, that everything boils, or the water always boils no matter where we are at 212. That is not the case. Boiling point where we live is 203. Because of the elevation, there is less air pressure pushing down on everything, and so that allows water to boil sooner. And so it will start boiling when it is at 203. Therefore, we have to increase the amount of um, pressure at which we can in order to have things be safe. Now, if you have a dial canner, like I do, then the actual PSI for us, according to the USDA, is 13 PSI. But if you don't have a dial canner, if all you have is a jiggler, a weighted canner, then at our elevation, you would be canning at 15 PSI. So what does that tell you about PSI? Well, pretty much logically thinking, anything under 1,000 is good to go at 10. Anything above 1,000 could be safely canned at 15 PSI because that's what USDA says for people who only have just the weighted gauge canner rather than the dial gauge canner. 
Now that's an important concept to know because what happens when the steam comes out of this vent, it has been calibrated scientifically how much force is needed to, to start moving this jiggler so that it goes like this. Now in my instruction book, it tells us that this, they call this a pressure regulator in the instruction book, and it is, it regulates the pressure because we don't want pressure to build up and build up and build up on the inside. There has to be some escape so that the pressure doesn't get too high. And so we set it by PSI. So since this is particularly weighted and can be moved by the air coming out of here, by the steam coming out of here, only when it gets to 15 PSI, I know that, that when this goes like this and starts releasing steam, I've got 15 PSI in here. So even though our suggested pressure for this elevation of 5,000 feet is 13 PSI, Jim and I watch it to be sure that it stays between 13 and 15. And that's just fine. A lot of people don't have this and they would be canning at 15 anyway. Number five is not starting the processing time over if the pressure falls below where it should. So if your pressure falls if our pressure falls below 13, we have to start all over again with the processing time. And let me explain the science behind that. It's happened to me a number of times, not a lot, but once in a while, um, the wind has blown out our flame outside and the pressure has dropped and we have to start all over again. And I think, oh darn it, I wish I could just get it back up. Isn't it hot enough in there to make this work? Well, when I was doing the testing of canners and I tracked the curve for temperature as it increased, a slight difference in pressure causes, I mean, if the pressure drops, it can drop it right out of the, the kill zone. And then by the time we get it back up to pressure, we've lost some precious time. And the kill zone is so important. So on that curve, once we get up into the kill zone, if the pressure drops, then um, it drops out of the kill zone. And that subtracts time away from the duration that the USDA says that we need to have. According to their testing, there is a certain duration within the processing time where it has to stay above constantly. Otherwise, this, the uh, spores may survive. So when I think of it that way, then I just get the heat back up again and start all over on the processing time. So that's really an important one. If you have a dial canner, and this is uh, number six, one of the big mistakes is not getting this calibrated every single year to be sure that it is measuring the correct pressure. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute in this canner in particular, and I'm not sure what your canner looks like like this, but you should have a vent as in addition to this. Many people who do a lot of canning live way out, away from towns, and getting this calibrated, as we have, um, found out from comments from so many of our viewers is can be a challenging thing to find some place that will calibrate this. Well, there is a sidestep and I use that sidestep um, because what is needed is the constant pressure and anything at our elevation between 13 and 15 is fine for canning. So I wouldn't, I don't even really need this because I can turn this into a weighted gauge canner just by using this. And so when it starts to jiggle very gently, I know that it's at 15. And I can just use that without even bothering about my dial. But here is a different kind of a weight. This is still 15 PSI but it has removable five pound weights. So when I take this off, now it is 10 PSI. So I can, if I'm canning at a thousand feet or below, I can use this 10 pound weight and sidestep this 
and wait for it to jiggle and keep jiggling and I know I'm there. But the other thing that it does is that it also gives you a true measure of what your dial is. If I'm doing 10 pounds PSI and this starts to jiggle, then I can look at my dial and it ought to be right at 10 pounds as well. So you can double check the accuracy of your dial by putting the, the right uh, size of weight on here. But it doesn't go, it goes, it jumps from 10 to 15. But you know, if, if you're if you're above, if, it's, if you're 11, 12, 13, or 14 pounds PSI, then you can simply use the 15 PSI and still be just fine. And so um, this little gadget is wonderful. But I do the same thing with this because we, where we live, this works just fine for me. But I always check to make sure that when this starts to jiggle, this should be reading 15. So this is a double check on this. All right, number seven is not following the processing time. Whenever we decide to cut things in half or double things or start doing fancy math and then think with, with jar size or whatever ever we might be doing, um, and then we do fancy math by adding a little processing time or subtracting a little processing time, we are flirting with the devil. So we need to accurately follow the processing time. Now, when I was doing the testing of the electric canners, I charted the temperature inside. I had a little gadget. Uh, that's why <laughs> we were known as, oh, that woman with a gadget for quite a while. Uh, I put my gadget down in the middle of a jar of food and then the jar in the canner for a batch. And I had in my gadget is a little computer that measures temperature. And I tracked the temperature every minute. So when I downloaded the data from the gadget, I could see the curve. I plotted that curve. And when the curve climbs and climbs and climbs, and then it reaches pressure and you hold it at pressure, then it's up in the kill zone if you've done everything right. And then you turn the heat off. The pressure doesn't immediately drop. The temperature does not immediately drop. It keeps going. And it needs that extra time to then start dropping in order to have enough time in the kill zone. And so if we are messing with the processing time, we are, we are messing with the safety of our food. Uh, number eight, a huge mistake that is sometimes made is not monitoring the canner throughout the entire processing time. Um, we can't just get things going and then walk away and leave it. A lot of people turned to the electric canners because that is exactly what they wanted to do. Get it started, walk away. Well, I don't ever do that. Don't ever do that because things can go wrong. Uh, be at home. We had um, friends years and years ago. They weren't canning, but they were cooking, pressure cooking, about five whole chickens in a canner exactly like this. And um, they got the pressure going and they had uh, turned it to where this was just gently going. There was a, I don't remember what canner they had. I just know it was a presto, a big presto. And they decided to go to the store. So they were gone from the house and then they got a little bit delayed and then they came back. And their canner, the, the overpressure plug had blown and it had gotten so overpressure that it blew the chicken through this hole, if you can imagine. And they had meat hanging from the ceiling. Their kitchen was a disaster when they came home. So please don't ever make the mistake of not monitoring. Um, you have to listen for your jiggler. If your jiggler starts going shh, um, and to where sometimes it can even fall off and then you have this mess. Um, but if it's, it should be just a or lower. As long as you have a little bit of steam escaping, you are at the PSI of the weight. So for us, it would be 15 PSI. But boy, if it starts jiggling like this and a lot of steam is coming out, you're above 15. So just make sure that you are monitoring. I use the Nesco a lot, um, but I never 
am too far away from the kitchen and I have my ear tuned. I'm walking through the kitchen all the time and so is Jim, so that we're monitoring the entire time. It's just not worth it to leave it to its own devices. Um, and then a, a mistake that I personally used to make as a young canner, I had a big family, I was always in a hurry, I tried to get things done as fast as possible, and so once this had finished, I would carry it over to the sink and run cold water on it to have the pressure drop. I had no clue what was happening to the temperature on the inside in terms of staying in the kill zone long enough. So don't make that mistake. Let whatever canner you have cool down until there is zero pressure. Don't rush it, let it cool down. It's gonna cool down. Now this cools down in about, it depends, I can outside. And on a cool day, it will cool down in probably about 45 minutes. Um, in the summer, not quite so fast. But my Nesco, which is electric, it takes between an hour and an hour and 15 to come down to zero pressure. So make sure that you let it cool down naturally. And then number 10, the last thing is that, um, and we just did a video on this in terms of flat sour. Flat sour is something that happens that influences the taste. It doesn't hurt anything. It won't kill you, it won't make you sick but there are some thermophilic bacteria, heat-loving bacteria that are not killed in the canning process. And if you leave them in the canner too long, then they are going to start multiplying and they turn your food sour-ish, off taste. And uh, they don't produce any gas, that's why it's called flat sour. We've done a, a video, I'll put it at the end so that you can uh, check it out if you wish. But the USDA says to get the jars out of the canner as soon as you can safely. Let it cool down all the way. Then let it sit for another extra five minutes to let the, the super boiling come down that's happening in the jars. Then you can crack the lid and let it sit another five minutes if you wish. And then when you open the canner, you can let it sit for another five minutes, but not longer than that. Um, the range of, recommend, of recommended time of leaving jars in the canner after the pressure is zero is between five and 20 minutes, depending on the expert. So not more than about 20 minutes after the, the pressure has come all the way to zero, those jars should be coming out of your canner. And, um, and when you take them out of the canner and set them out on your countertop. I put mine on a rack. Um, don't put them on a towel. A towel kind of holds the heat. What we want is for the heat to get out of those jars as soon as possible. So don't put them close together. Give them some air space on the rack and then just let them cool down. We want those thermophilic bacteria to not have the opportunity to start um, reproducing. And so we need to drop that temperature because they won't that they're not lively in lower temperatures. And so we just need to get the temperatures down as soon as possible. So these are 10 mistakes that are very common with, with those of us who do pressure canning. And we just need to be mindful of what not to do as well as what to do. And so canning is an adventure any way that you look at it. I hope these 10 uh, mistakes have helped refine your own processing and um, Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again very soon for another video.